as announcements. Let's bring our first speaker to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Tyler Good Early. Tyler's talk is titled For the Love of Sea Cucumbers, Hormonal Secrets. Oh, clicker. Woo! Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. My name is Tyler Gooderly. I'm a PhD student at UH Manoa in the Department of Human Nutrition, Food, and Animal Sciences, and under the advisement of Dr. Andre Seal, who is with us tonight. <laughs> yes, give it up for Andre. <laughs> Andre has helped shape the blossoming endocrinologist who is standing before you. Endocrinology, what does that mean? That means I study hormones, and specifically, I study the hormones of sea cucumbers. So tonight, I hope to answer the burning questions you have, like, what is a sea cucumber? And why are they important? And what about their hormones? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the sea cucumber. Now, this is a sea cucumber egg. All sea cucumbers start out in eggs, and from that egg hatch a single larva. The larvae go through several metamorphic stages before they do their final metamorphosis into a miniature adult. So pictured on the right there, that's the last larval stage. So from there, they find a nice home and then they turn into something like this. There are 1700 species globally. We see them primarily on tropical reefs, but they're also in the temperate, in the Arctic, and even in the deep sea. They're in the same phylum as sea urchins and starfish, so those are their closely related cousins. And I should have mentioned this, they are animals, not plants. And they are ecologically important. Sometimes you hear them being referred to as the vacuum cleaners of the sea or the earthworms of the sea, and that's because of their feeding behavior. They consume sand, they ingest sand, and with it, all the biological material, so feces and bacteria, dead things, microalgae, and they use that biological material as fuel. Then they excrete clean sand that has been partially digested. So then there's calcium carbonate that is available for surrounding corals to absorb and incorporate into their skeletons. Sea cucumbers also hold cultural value. They're depicted in the Hawaiian origin story, Kumulipo, and we also see them in pop culture references like Pokemon and SpongeBob. There's even a 500 page book filled with a thousand poems all about sea cucumbers. So sea cucumbers have been celebrated by people for a long time, and that includes culinarily. Sea cucumbers are consumed across the globe. They're full of awesome nutrients like protein. They have 65% more protein weight for weight than beef. They also have biomedical compounds like phenols and collagen, which are used both in the cosmetic industry and in the medical world. Compounds extracted from sea cucumbers can treat things like obesity and even kill cancer. So there's this booming sea cucumber market. It was estimated that in 2015 to be 6 billion US dollars and growing. 90 countries participate in sea cucumber trade and 80 species are harvested to supply this demand. And some of those species can fetch really high values, upwards of 3,000 US dollars per kilogram. But unfortunately, we have been harvesting sea cucumbers at unsustainable rates. We see titles, uh, news headlines like catastrophic depletion and overexploitation, which has led to 16 species being put on the IUCN Red List, which is a compilation of the world's most imperiled species. Five of those species are CITES cross-listed, meaning you can't trade those across country lines. And two of these species occur here in Hawaii. So I hope by now I've convinced you that sea cucumbers are important and celebrated and also imperiled. So what can we do? Well, we can produce sea cucumbers sustainably in aquaculture, which can do two things. It can meet market demands and also augment wild populations. And we've seen an increase in the production of sea cucumbers in aquaculture in the last 20 years or so. And 
Um, if you look at the figure on the right in the brown there, you can see that the aquaculturally produced sea cucumbers are entering the market and meeting some demand. However, only a few countries are producing sea cucumbers on a commercial scale, and none of that is coming from the US. And not to mention also, we are harvesting more sea cucumbers from the wild than ever before. So we've got the demand for sea cucumbers and we have the economics. Why aren't we producing more? And that's because the reproduction of sea cucumbers is complicated despite them looking like simple creatures. And we don't really understand their reproduction. Some sea cucumbers spawn year round, usually tied with the lunar cycle, which is pretty remarkable in itself because they don't have eyes. Other sea cucumbers spawn only once a year and they rely on other environmental cues, sometimes changes in temperature or food availability. In this graph, this um, depicts the gonadal somatic index, which is just a metric we use to measure reproductive viability. And you can see that it peaks in the warm months. So that species only spawns in the summertime. So to summarize that, there are environmental cues that the sea cucumbers are intimately attuned to. And then something happens inside of them that changes their physiology and prepares them for spawning. Does anybody know what drives those changes? Hormones. Yes, hormones. Good answer. So what is a hormone? Um, this scientist, Ernest Starling, is credited with coining the term. And hormones can de be defined as biological compounds that are produced in one organ and exert an effect on another. OK, so if we take our sea cucumber example, this sea cucumber likes to spawn during the full moon and it has found itself under the tantalizing light of a full moon. So it is being stimulated. It's detecting that full moon in its nervous system. And from here, a cascade of events happen that tell it to spawn. And to investigate that, we have to zoom in a little bit further. So the nervous system is composed of cells. And if we zoom into the nucleus, we have the DNA, which is the blueprint for all of the proteins that the CQ4 makes, including peptide or protein hormones. But there's a catch. The DNA is trapped in the nucleus. So in order for the sea cucumber to make hormones, peptide hormones, we need a Xerox copy of this blueprint that needs to be sent out to a factory to make the protein. And the mechanisms at which biological organisms do this is through transcribing the DNA into RNA, which is free to leave the nucleus, and is intercepted by ribosomes, which are the protein-making factories. They um, translate the RNA into chains of amino acids, which are the basic building blocks of proteins. Then sometimes there's some post-translational modifications that happen to mature the hormones, which are then sent into circulation to find their target cell or tissue. Now, there are two hormones that are known to play roles in reproduction in sea cucumbers, and these kind of act sequentially, so you could think of them like a relay race. So the first, relaxin-like gonad-stimulating peptide, this does two things. First, it matures the gonads. So like I said, sometimes sea cucumbers only spawn once a year, and during the off-season, their gonads shrink. And so RGP helps mature the gonad, grow the gonad, and prepare it for reproduction. And it also acts on the follicle cells, which the eggs develop in. So you can see on the bottom here, there's an egg within a follicle cell. And so RGP, um, the egg cells, they go through four, five stages of maturation, and RGP takes them all the way to stage four. And that's when it hands off the baton to this other hormone, cubifrin, to finish the race. So cubifrin also does two things. It takes those eggs from stage four um, here to stage five, um, which is denoted by the breakdown of the germinal vesicle. And then it tells the sea cucumber to spawn, to release those eggs. Oh, and... Um, these have only been documented in a few species, and we have seen that the amino acid sequences, the basic building blocks for those proteins, vary between species and sometimes don't work across species. In other words, 
those sequences are species specific. So I'd like to introduce you to the sea cucumber that I study, Stachopus horans. It goes by many names. You may have heard it called Namako, and the Hawaiian name is Unai. It's uh, native to Hawaii. It's nocturnal. I often find it accompanied with this symbiotic crab. And this is one of those species that's coveted. It's um, harvested both for culinary purposes and for medical purposes. And so my research is to understand the reproductive mechanisms of this species by characterizing those two hormones I talked about, RGP and cupifrin, and then testing their effects on inducing reproduct reproductive behavior. So to date, I've extracted nervous tissue from Stachopus horans, and then from that, I extracted the total RNA, so all the Xerox copies of the DNA that tell us what the sequences are for those proteins or protein hormones. We sent that out for sequencing. What I got back was 100 gigabytes of data. I then went through um, a lot of computational work to ascertain those specific amino acid sequences. We then worked with project partners to synthesize those hormones. Um, and here's a little sneak peek at our results. So this is our cubiferin that's in uh, our freezer now. And all the other sea cucumber species, it's been described as having five amino acids. And our and Stachopus horans, it has six. And RGP is far more complex. It's two chains of amino acids connected by disulfide bridges. It's 43 amino acids, and it's in the same family, same protein family as insulin. So our next steps are to test these hormones in vitro and in vivo. We've done a preliminary trial and results from that suggest that this will work. So in conclusion, sea cucumbers hold ecological value. They're nutritionally really dense. They hold cultural value. And wild sea cucumber populations are imperiled. Aquaculture can meet these demands, but we don't really understand their reproduction. So perhaps, Hormones hold the secrets. Thank you. Mahalo, Tyler. Questions for Tyler? Yes. Oh. oh. And can you repeat the question? Yes. So the question is about gamat oil, which is pictured here. Um, so Stachopus horans doesn't just um, occur in the waters of Hawaii. It's found in other tropical areas, including Malaysia, where they harvest these sea cucumbers and they take out the juices of its circulatory system. And that is what gamat oil is made out of. And this is used to treat burns and wounds. And it's also used to relax muscles. It's used as a massage oil. Um, and there actually is like a lot of scientific evidence to back that up. All of the um, all of the immune system functions of the sea cucumber come from the juices that go into this. Does the, um, that, that juice, does that include the hormones that you study or is that defined to the part of the biology? Can we repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, the question is, um, does the circulatory juice or liquid contain the hormones I'm studying or is it confined somewhere else? And so, we don't actually know for sure where it's being produced. There's evidence that it's being produced in the nerve, that the hormones are being produced in the nervous system. And then they would have to travel to their target tissues, which are, we know, are the gonads and the gametes, the egg cells. Um, but part of my research is also to figure out where it's being produced. Yep. Do we have time for more? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Mr. Walton. Okay. Dr. Walton. So, with those sort of hormones, like the animal hormones, if they, if they run off into the waters, do they affect like the hormones that the cucumbers are trying to develop or put up the cats? Yeah, so the question is about environmental concerns using hormones in agriculture. 
And there are uh, different classes uh, to answer that, I guess. Um, there are different classes of hormones. The hormones that I'm using, they're peptide hormones or protein hormones. And so they don't live long outside of the body in a, in a way that would induce effects on other things. Other hormones that you might be familiar with, like testosterone, that's um, a steroid hormone. And those are more, um, they are less degraded. They take longer to degrade. Let's take yes. this last question from. We talk about audience. harvesting, but uh, does climate change affect the sheep of cucumber? And if we lost them, what would happen? Yeah. So the question is, what about climate change, and what happens if you lose sea cucumbers? So to answer the second part, we've seen the loss of sea cucumbers already in some areas. Um, the Galapagos is one area that's been hit really hard and their sea cucumber populations are virtually non-existent. And we've seen that the corals there are becoming less resistant to pathogens. And so we don't really understand the dynamic relationships between sea cucumbers and corals, but we know that without the sea cucumbers, they're not doing as well. And um, another leg of my research is actually to understand how sea cucumbers respond to climate change. But uh, this maybe first and then that, yes. So next year, maybe. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you so much. Audience, awesome job with the applause. Keep it up. We love it. Um, let's bring our next speaker up to this stage. Our next speaker is Tressa Hoppy. And Tressa's talk is titled Getting Interpersonal with Plants, Forest as Community. Give it up for Tressa. All right, aloha kako, ninjje. Hello, my name is Tressa Hoppy. I am a PhD student in the botany department in Dr. Tamara Tickton's lab. And I do a lot of work focused on ecology of terrestrial ecosystems, but it's relevant, I promise. <laughs> There's a lot of ocean talk today, but I'm going to be talking with you about getting interpersonal with plants, forest as community. So for starters, oops, let's see. Ah, oh, there we go. I got to point at that, not the screen. Okay, so for starters, welcome to the neighborhood. So an ecosystem is a community made up of many individuals and ohana, just like our human neighborhoods are. Everybody has different personalities. Everybody has different roles that they fulfill. So in a forest, for example, they're made up of our plant people, insect people, bird people, microbial people, and all of these community members have roles they fulfill and they interact with each other just like you do with your neighbors. And ecosystems impact each other, especially on islands where you know, we have limited space and really dense microhabitats. And anything that happens upstream is gonna affect what happens downstream. So speaking of interactions, there it goes. So, Again, just like with people, interactions between species are complex and contextual, so they change based on what's going on, right? You might have a really good relationship with your neighbor, but then something happens and all of a sudden you don't like each other so much anymore, right? So the same is true with plants, right? Uh, there's a really big range of interactions that can happen between them, but for the sake of simplicity, we're going to stick with competition and facilitation. So competition is when plants that use the same resources compete. So for example, if we're looking at a forest understory and there's two seedlings growing next to each other, the limiting resource is going to be light, right? And so they're going to compete for each other. And the outcome of that is going to usually have a winner and a loser. Whereas facilitation is positive interactions between species. So anytime one species benefits and then the other species either has a neutral or potentially positive effect, that's facilitation. So an example in Hawaii is there's studies that have found that uh, there's way more seedling recruitment in bryophyte mats, so like mosses. They help to sort of shelter and protect the seedlings and the seedlings get that facilitative benefit. 
And a healthy community has a diverse suite of species and interactions so that everybody can fulfill their role. And then you get a healthy functioning ecosystem. So ecosystem function is the sort of things that the ecosystem provides for us, but then also for the rest of sort of the land, right? So if you have a healthy forest, that's gonna provide us with fresh drinking water, but it's also gonna make sure that the water that runs down the river is clean and isn't gonna put a bunch of sedimentation on our coral reefs, right? So we've talked about healthy ecosystems, unfortunately. Frequently, that is not the case, especially nowadays. So there's lots of things that can cause these breakdowns in relationships that can cause ecosystem degradation. So disturbance, environmental destruction, invasive species, climate change, trophic breakdown, and all of these things have these cascading effects. And well, there goes the neighborhood, right? So these are all actually pictures I've taken. Uh, extinction is another big one. Uh, a lot of our birds are extinct. And when they go, that relationship they have with the plant is also gone. And then the plant might struggle, right? So these relationships are all really important. And it's really important that we consider what we need to do when those interactions start to break down and the ecosystem starts to, you know, maybe go in a direction we don't want it to. So here's a little, um, graph I made or a little figure I made. So we've got sort of, you know, maybe what we've got going on right now versus maybe in a more ideal world, right? So in the system we have now, what we end up with is reduced native forests, mostly to the tops of our mountain ranges. We have invasive forests below that, water diversion for monocropping, be it like sugarcane, pineapple, any of those species, you're really just pumping water into the ground, pumping fertilizer into the ground, growing this one crop and uh, you know just sort of taking and taking until you deplete the soils. And once you deplete the soils and it's not profitable anymore, you end up with fallow agricultural land, which then can cause increased runoff, not just of sedimentation, but also of fertilizers. It can cause algae blooms and all kinds of negative consequences for our coastal environments. So the forest is important for marine as well. Um, and then when we think about, of course, um, these fallow ag lands, a lot of times one of the problems we encounter is invasive species, particularly fire-loving invasive species. I think we all remember and it weighs on our hearts what happened in Lahaina. And so we need to consider what the land is doing so that we can prevent things like that from happening, right? So when we think about a fire like that and about what we can do to make sure it doesn't happen again, it's about um, keeping things more diverse, right? Having our diverse, healthy ecosystems, uh, doing agriculture sustainably, multi-cropping, that sort of thing. And then that can lead to a whole healthy ridge to reef system. So when we talk about rebuilding our ecosystems, there's some amount of natural regeneration that can happen. So, uh, you know, if you're in an area surrounded by healthy forests, some of those seeds can make it there. But unfortunately, we usually can't do that. And so people have to step in and do ecosystem restoration. So uh, planting species in areas that were previously degraded to hopefully restore that forest, restore that community and all of the interactions in there. So not just planting one species, but planting a whole bunch of them. So that way you can restore those connections. And one of the ways that we can do that best is by working together, right? So people help each other, people help plants, plants help people and plants can help each other. And if we can utilize that ability of plants to sort of have positive interactions with each other, then we can hopefully use that to enhance the success of ecological restoration. And that's sort of the focus of my project. So I started my PhD working in Makaha Valley I did an experiment where we outplanted three common uh, native species used in restoration and planted them either in the presence of ferns or in the absence of ferns and compared uh, survival and uh, growth and all of those good things. And we're gonna expand that to this site right here is actually Kulani. It's an agroforestry site in Heia. We have volunteer days every third Saturday of the month if you wanna <laughs> come by, it's good fun. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you this graph. So pretty simple. This is just the overall predicted survival in the two sites that I have between either the control or the fern treatment. So control on the left, fern on the right. 
And the sites, the red one, is an active restoration site where a lot of the canopy has been cut. And so it's a lot brighter, a lot drier, maybe a little more stressful in that way. And then the blue line is another site that's a more established uh, native forest with a more dense canopy, so less sunshine, a little wetter. Right. And if you just looked at this graph, you might think, OK, well, there's not much going on at the closed canopy site. There's not really any competition between the ferns and the native plants. That's good. And then you look at the restoration site and you go, oh, wow, there's an increase in uh, in survival. You think, oh, my God, we did it. It's great. Everything's wonderful. We just plant ferns everywhere and it's perfect. And that's not exactly the truth. Unfortunately, I wish it was that simple. It never is. So if you look a little more closely, when we separate based on site, so on the left, this is the dense canopy uh, site, and on the right, this is the restoration site. And here we see the three different species we use. So koa on the top, which is a tree that is fairly well adapted to dry areas. Uki uki, which is uh, an understory forb, so like a grass, but not. Um, and then the green is mamaki, which is a shrub to a tree, uh, a little more sensitive to drought. And what we see is on the left here, uh, where we thought there wasn't really anything going on, actually, uh, there is something going on because, uh-oh, the uki uki is doing worse in the presence of ferns, which indicates that there is competition. And that makes sense because they both occupy the same uh, sort of space on the forest floor, right? They both stay pretty low. So in an area where light is the limiting factor with a dense canopy, they compete with each other, which we wouldn't know if we just looked at the other ground. And then we can see there's sort of mild but not statistically significant effects on the mamaki and not much change with the koa. And then when we look at the active restoration site, the place where there was, oh yay, there was an increase in survival, what we actually see is that the significant increase in survival was just for one species, it was just for the koa. So we find that yes, there is some help uh, in that situation, there's a lot of sort of neutral effects, and then there are actually even some negative effects. So, right, really context dependent, like we were saying earlier, things can change. And, you know, if you looked at this site 50 years ago, maybe you would have gotten a slightly different result because conditions were different back then, right? So, we need to focus on what's going on. And there are, again, a lot going on. So, it's way more complicated than it seems. And so you start getting all of these data points and you start plugging them into R and you start going through all of your thousands of data points and you start getting errors and you're wondering, why did I do this to myself? This is an actual picture of me trying to figure out how to work a selfie stick to take pictures of my fern plots. I did not take that on purpose. Um, and you wonder, why am I doing this? And then you take a step back from your computer and you take a deep breath and you remember that you do it because it's worth it because if we can understand these communities, we can help to preserve them and all the connections that are in there. We can hopefully bring back these communities in areas that have been degraded and we can restore those connections, that function, we can bring the neighborhood back. And most especially because we're part of that community. Human beings are not separate from nature. We require, we need each other to live, really. I mean, we honestly, we need nature way more than nature needs us, but um, you know, we need each other and we're part of that community. And so we need to do our best to take care of it. And these are some references, and that has been my talk. Thank you all very much. I don't want to talk for you to talk, but take some questions from our in-person and online audience. Any questions for Tressa? I will get us going. So Tressa, you said that you are working on some restoration sites in Makaha mm -hmm. and also at Pu'ulani. Mm -hmm. um, do you expect things to be kind of similar, kind of different? Can you tell us what your expectations are for those two study sites? Well, I'd say I definitely expect them to be different, especially because the types of restoration that are happening are different. So in Makaha, the restoration is more of your um, sorry, uh, traditional, like just ecosystem restoration. We're trying to restore to like, say, a past um, reference point. Right. So we want this percent native tree cover and we want this percent uh, invasive cover or like we want invasives gone, whatever the sort of goal of the restoration is. At Pu'ulani, it's agroforestry. So it's a combination of native plants and food plants and medicine plants. And so it's not as much of that strict 
restoration. It's more about uh, sort of what the community wants and needs. And so I am definitely expecting some different results. And also Pu'ulani I'll be using as a sort of a way to test the effects of ferns on like the biotic component, right? So we found that there is some improvement in survival, likely uh, in a reduction of like light stress and water stress at this one site. And at Pu'ulani, what we're gonna do is uh, slug inclusion and exclusion trials, because we find, okay, the ferns have this positive effect in dry places on some species, but they might also, you know, you know, well slugs, shady wet places slugs. So we wanna see if sort of untangling all of those different layers of uh, interactions, because there's always more. If you think you've gotten to the end of, of the interactions, you absolutely have not. <laughs> Um, so yes, the Makaha uh, site on the on military property? No, no, it's on, actually it's on Board of Water Supply land. So a lot of, actually most of Upper Makaha Valley is Board of Water Supply land. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry, repeating the question. The earlier question was about the, oh, you were on the mic for the earlier uh, yeah, hot mic. Uh, there we go. Sorry, for this question, the question was, the work in Makaha, is it on military land? And the answer is no, it's on um, Board of Water Supply land, though there is some management from the Oahu Army Natural Resource Program, which does work with the military, but they mostly manage that area because there are some of the species which they manage, some of the critically endangered species also exist in Makaha, so it's one of their management areas. My friend wanted to know, um, aside from volunteering on your volunteer day, is there anything that people uh, at home or on their own properties can do as far as like helping to promulgate or? Oh, absolutely. The question is, what can people just do on their own in their own yards and their own property? Uh, to help with restoration and absolutely like plant native species do some research on what grows in your area especially like you know I live in a really dry coastal area so uh, wet loving plants are not for me so I've planted a lot of really resilient coastal species and then you use less water you waste less water um, and even you know even if you don't have a yard just you know Call your representative, put a little pressure on them to, you know, support uh, ecosystem restoration efforts. And if any bill comes across like the protecting America's wildlife thing, just, you know, that's another great way you can help even if you don't have land. Okay. Time for one more. Let's okay. take one more question. Okay. All right. Sorry, I saw you first. Have you guys had any conversations about like the potential for fungal species in the soil? Like the importance of your actions? Yeah, so the question was about uh, fungi in the soil being part of these interactions. Absolutely. I am not a mycologist. I wish I had enough room in my brain for plants and fungi, but um, I'm actually at Pu'ulani. We're working with Dr. Kiana Frank, who's a super awesome microbial person, and so we're doing soil samples in areas where we've planted ferns and then control plots where we haven't planted ferns. And I'm hoping to extend that into my research in Makaha as well to see what the microbial diversity of the soil is. Because there have been studies that indicate that ferns help uh, sort of bolster the um, microbial diversity of soils. So okay, I changed my mind. We're gonna take one last question. Your question, yes. yes. Cool, I was wondering, the native species, will they always need our intervention for them to have a hold in the area? Or will, is there a potential that someday they'll be able to take back over without our functional intervention? That's a great question. So the question was, um, will native species always need human intervention? Or will there be some point in time where they're able to sort of regenerate on their own? And the answer is yes and no, right? So there are some areas where we've done restoration and there is like, you know, it requires very minimal maintenance. I used to work with the Army Natural Resource Program. And so there are some areas that are like recruiting on their own, native species are coming back, even some endangered species are recruiting on their own. And it's super awesome. But there are some cases where, you know, say we have an endangered plant species where the pollinator doesn't exist anymore, or like the pollinator has gone extinct. That plant will always require human intervention in some way to perpetuate because if it can't produce its own seed, it can't continue the species. So yes and no. And there's also some uh, possibilities for alternate stable states. So essentially like it's not a perfect native forest, but maybe it's a native forest with some ulu or some other fruit trees that are non-native but non-invasive and are useful and culturally significant. So there's lots of possibilities. Awesome. Thank you, Tressa. Mahalo, Tressa. Thank you.
Okay, audience, we have come to the part of our program where we do the raffle. Drum roll, please. Oh, and get your tickets out, get your tickets out. Drum roll, get your tickets out. Heather's gonna select a lucky ticket. Six <laughs> you can come get your Sea Grant t-shirt wow. after we are done with the talks. You get to pick the style and size. Very exciting. Beth has an announcement. Uh, really quickly, I failed to thank Jake Snyder, who is here, who helps with the setup of the exhibit, the programming, the digital programming, and all the labels. So please give a hand for Jake for all of that. Thank you so much. We also have Kyle Richman over here who will help with the setup, and Heather Duda, Maya Walton, and a whole team. Um, so please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our third and final speaker this evening is Annie Innes Gold. And Annie's talk is titled In Hot Water Forecasting Fisheries Under Climate Change. Big round of applause for Annie. Hi, uh, my name is Annie. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, working with Dr. Liz Naden and Dr. Lisa McManus in the audience over there. Uh, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about forecasting fisheries under climate change. So first, we're just going to think kind of broadly about forecasts in general. And I think for most people, when you hear that word, you probably think about weather forecasts, which right are just trying to predict what the weather will be like in the future so that you can plan for it. And first, we're going to think about what do we need for a good weather forecast. And I'm not a meteorologist um, by any means, but thanks to Google and ChatGPT, I was able to find out some of these things. Um, so one thing you need is reliable past observations. So what has the weather been like in the past? You know, things like the temperature, sun, wind, humidity, rain. And you want that information to be reliable. And then you also want an accurate picture of the current conditions. So what is the weather like out right now? And with these forecasts, the more observations you can get, the better. So you want to get as much information as possible so you can make the most informed prediction possible. And different kinds of forecasts can give different results. So you might see this if you have two different weather apps that you check, and they're predicting slightly different temperatures for that day. And we're probably all aware of this one, but weather forecasts, you know, they're not always right, but most of us find them pretty useful for how we go about planning for our day or our week. Um, but today's talk is not about weather, it's about fisheries. And so we can think about how this same premise applies to fisheries. So when I say fi forecasting fisheries, I'm referring to trying to predict what fish populations will look like in the future um, so that we can plan for our sustainable seafood supply. And we'll start off with the same question. So what do we need for a good fisheries forecast? Um, and we need a lot of the same things. So we want reliable past observations. You know, what has the fish population looked like historically? Um, you know, how many fish were there? How fast did that population grow? How often did they reproduce? How long do they live? Things like that. And then we want an accurate picture of the current condition. So what does the fish population look like right now? How many fish are there? How much fishing is going on? And just like before, the more observations we can get, the better our forecast is gonna be. And just like before, different kinds of forecasts can give different results. So you could use two different methods of forecasting, starting with the exact same starting conditions, and they might give slightly different estimates for what the fish population will look like. And just like the weather, you know, these forecasts are not always right. Um, you know, we can't really always predict what's gonna happen in nature, but they're still useful for how we go about planning for our future. And with these kinds of forecasts, you know, we can make our best predictions, but we obviously can't control um, what's going to happen. And it's the same for fisheries. Um, you know, we, we try our best to predict, but we can't control what the fish population will end up doing. But we can control how we interact with them. And this brings us to the idea of fisheries management. 
So fisheries management refers to managing interactions between people and natural resources to ensure the long-term sustainability of fish populations. Um, and there's different strategies that are used in fisheries management. So I'll go through a few examples. So one is spatial closures. So a common example of this is a marine protected area or an MPA where um, fishing effort is regulated in a spatial way. So a certain area might have different regulations on what is allowed versus open fishing grounds. Another strategy is bag limits, where for a certain species, um, the number of fish or sometimes the size of the fish that you're allowed to keep um, is restricted or regulated. There are seasonal closures where a certain time of year might have um, different regulations than the rest of the year. And um, this can coincide with the spawning season for a fish population to allow that population to reproduce to the fullest extent. And then there are gear restrictions where a certain type of fishing gear might be prohibited. So an example of this would be something, an area that prohibits blast fishing because it can cause damage to the surrounding habitat. So forecasting can play a big role in deciding which strategy to use. So one way that these forecasting methods are, is used is that before implementing any of these strategies, researchers and managers can try to predict what the fish population would look like under different management scenarios, and then decide which one aligns the best with the goals of their fishery. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these kinds of forecasts work today. Um, they're based on mathematical models, and we're not gonna get super in the weeds today, um, no, no equations, but um, well, I'm going to talk through some of the main steps of a mathematical model I'm working on in order to do some of this fisheries forecasting. So for my model, these are the kinds of questions that I'm interested in answering. So I'm looking at what management strategies lead to the highest fish populations and highest fisheries harvest. And then I'm also interested in trying to understand how climate change impacts the predicted fish populations and fisheries harvest. So again, thinking very broadly and conceptually about this model, you can think about it like a computer game or a simulation. Um, so in my simulation, I have two different areas. I have an open fishing grounds area and a no-take MPA area. And then to start off, we have a population of fish in each area that grows. Then we have fisheries harvest that occurs in the open fishing grounds. So this leaves us with the rest of the population as the non-harvested fish. And then the fish can disperse or they move between the two areas, so in and out of the MPA and the open fishing grounds. Um, so that's the end of the steps, and then we just start from step one over again um, and move to the next time step. And then in my simulation, I'm going to test um, two different kinds of management strategies. So the first kind is of spatial closures. So here in my simulation, I vary the amount of waters that are designated as no-take MPAs from zero to 100%. And then I'm also testing um, different levels of fishing effort. So I vary a fishing effort value from a value of zero, meaning no fishing at all, to a value of one, which essentially is saying that all the fish biomass is being removed from this system. So now to get into some kind of preliminary results from this work. So here I'm looking at the total fish biomass. So that's the whole fish population grouped together as one mass or one weight. And then the horizontal axis is showing the percent waters close to fishing, so how much is inside these no-take MPAs. Um, the color of the line shows the fishing effort, so ranging from zero to that very high value of one. And you know, takeaways here are that we see the most fish, um, the yeah, highest fish biomass with um, high closures, so high amount of area in MPAs, and with a low fishing effort. We see the least fish with a really high fishing effort level and with um, no waters close to fishing or no MPAs. So that's pretty much what we would expect to see kind of in a simulation like this. Um, and now we can also look at the total harvest. So now instead of the fish population itself, we're looking at how much the fisheries are harvesting from it. And we can see we get the most harvest at a kind of low to intermediate fishing effort um, and with a, about a 20% area closure or 20% MPAs. Um, that gives us the most fisheries harvest. And the least harvest we see with a really high fishing effort level because essentially it's causing overfishing, so too much is being taken from the population for it to be able to sustain itself. And we also see the least harvest at either really low MPAs or really high MPAs. Um, but part of my talk title was also about climate change effects. And so we're gonna think about how these can be incorporated into these kinds of forecasts. So climate change affects fish populations um, in multiple ways. 
But one of the ways it affects it is a direct effect of warming waters on the fish population growth rate. So a population growth rate refers to births minus deaths in a population. And to sum up a lot of previous research very briefly, um, in general, warmer waters can cause reef fish to um, have fewer eggs, so fewer births. And it, warmer waters can also lead to higher reef fish mortality, so higher deaths. So overall, you know, warmer waters essentially will reduce the population growth rate. Another way that climate change can affect fish populations um, is a more indirect effect on their habitat. So this brings us to the idea of carrying capacity, which just refers to the maximum amount of fish that a habitat can hold. So in general, you know, healthier and more complex coral reef habitats can hold more fish, so they have a higher carrying capacity. So as waters warm and it causes coral reefs to degrade, they can't hold as many fish anymore, so they have a lower carrying capacity. So to look at some preliminary results from this part of the project, um, we're again looking at the total harvest that fisheries are um, getting, and then uh, uh, the horizontal axis is again, the amount of water exposed to fishing or the amount in MPAs. And now the color of the line represents different ways that I've looked at climate change in my simulation. So this top line that's showing the most harvest predicted has no climate change impact. So I'm not accounting for how climate change might affect the fish population. Then, you know, the next line we're going to look at, I'm saying climate change impacts that carry capacity. So essentially saying the warmer waters are reducing the maximum amount of fish the habitat can hold. So this gives us a slightly lower harvest. Um, then third, I'm saying now climate change impacts that growth rate. So the warmer waters are reducing how fast the population is growing. Um, and this gives us an even lower harvest. And then finally, I'm saying climate change is now impacting carrying capacity and growth rate um, same simultaneously. And this gives us the lowest harvest of all. Um, so overall, you know, these results highlight the multiple ways that climate change can affect fish populations um, and how, you know, it, um, the predictions of harvest end up being lowered kind of by different extents, depending on which impact you're looking at. Um, yeah, so kind of to wrap up, you know, it's important to think about and plan for how climate change will affect fish populations. And here I've demonstrated some of those effects and how they can be incorporated into these kinds of fisheries forecasts. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, Danny. Let's take questions both from our in-person and online audience. Online audience, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat and we'll read those out loud. Questions um, from our audience? Yes, let's take this question from Hal. And then repeat the question. But I was just curious, the first part you were making, uh, what, what did you factor in the, in the first part? Yeah, so I, I had the total fish biomass and then the fisheries harvest. Yeah, so I was wondering, did those be manipulated to overcome any of the bad effects of climate change? Yeah, so it's, I think through the management side of things is what can be manipulated. I think right, we can't directly manipulate the fish population itself, but we can manipulate the how it's being managed. So kind of the interactions with the fish populations by like reducing fishing effort, and then that could kind of compensate for some of the how the warming waters are um, reducing the fish population. If we reduce the fishing pressure on it, then it increases it a bit, so it kind of compensates. So I think that yeah, that's kind of a way that it could. Compensate for it. What about changing RFAs? Sorry? Um, changing the RFAs. Restricted fishing. Rate. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of, um, I guess, oh, sorry, I didn't repeat any of these. Uh, um, the question was about compensating for climate change impacts through um, manipulating fish populations and management strategies. So, yeah, I think manipulating, um, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's right on. So it's kind of with the, with the MPA scenario. So changing how much, how many areas you're allowed to fish versus not is um, can get similar results to changing the fishing effort overall. Let's take other questions from our audience. Let's take this question over here. <laughs> I was really interested. I, I was familiar with that finding that said about 20% of uh, coastal areas being restricted from fishing led to the best catch. Is that kind of the accepted number of what you're finding in your research? And is that what is Generally done here in our coastal areas? Yeah. Um, Repeat the question, please. Oh. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, the question was about how um, that kind of 20% um, area close to fishing led to the most harvest of all the scenarios. And um, yeah, I mean, it depends a bit on like the area, like the place that you're looking at, but like in the scientific literature, like the kind of 20 to 30% is a common one you'll see to actually maximize harvest because it allows for enough of the fish population to um, be in those closed areas and supplement the um, outside fish population enough. So that's actually supplementing the harvest overall. Um, and then in terms of kind of what is going on here, um, there's, I think we're in a bit of a transition area where there's a push for, for more management of, of reef fisheries. And so I think that's kind of the Holomua initiative with DAR. And I think that's kind of something they're working on is figuring out um, which management strategies will, will maximize harvest as well. Great, thank you, Annie. Round of applause for Annie, thank you. Okay, let's take this online question. Um, I'm gonna read it. Okay, this is a question from Gnome and it says, you looked at how the percentage of area closed to fishing affects biomass. Does the model include space? That is, does it matter which areas are close to fishing? Um, yeah, good question. So my model does not, it's not a very um, spatially explicit model. So I'm not looking at which areas, I'm just looking at the overall amount. Um, but there are certainly other models that are much more focused on the spatial aspect and um, it can they can definitely show that which areas would um, have a big impact on on um, the fish populations and harvest. Awesome, thank you, Annie. 